morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the October Resident Council meeting. And we will start this off with the uh, council members' roll call. so I can hear you when I call your name. Lestra? Here. Nancy? Here. Kayha? Here. Suzanne? Here. Richard Fluke? Here. Thank you. David? Yes. Jim Coleman? Here. Martha Reeves? Here. Tom Haynes? Here. Jerry James? Molly Williams? Here. Kim Cummings? Here. Ed Ross? Moira Ebling. Here. Marty King. Rena Brooks. Here. Barbara Toschalis. Here. Jerry McClellan. Here. Jim Bigelow. Here. Larry Moon. Jean Apple. Here. Marion Haney. Helen Coverdale. Here. Maria Zuniga. Bob Tower. Here. Catherine Brunia. Here. Evelyn Tayborn. Darlene Mosier. Here. Here. Mary Lou Sanderson. Helen Tucker. Here. Hilmar Burgess. Bob Andrews. Bob Kinkema. Here. Ann Grandstaff. Here. Louise Goostry. Here. Diane Haskins. Here. Julia Hartenberger. Joan Hines. Sally Munger. Mary Cotton. Joanne Dodson. Teresa Klein. Mel White. Here. Rose Popham. Here. Diane Rabbers. Here. Nancy Shaleri. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead and ask for approval of the Sure. We'd like to, to uh, bring up the minutes of the last resident council meeting. Um, are there any corrections or additions to those minutes? Yeah, the second page, uh, middle paragraph, does not specify that those COVID numbers, I believe, are for the county. They are certainly not for the Friendship Village community. Correct. Okay, I've got that one. Any more? I saw more hands. We covered them? Okay. Thank you. The minutes will be approved after as corrected. Before I start with the treasurer's report, I would really like us all to thank Tom Hayes for having managed to keep us well positioned financially for the past two years. Thank you. I was going to wish him happy time off, but he's taken on the job of working with the archives, which is probably going to be at least as time consuming. Um, that said, what you see in front of you is the September 
treasurer's report. So it's the end of last year. So those final numbers that you see will be the final numbers for the 2021 fiscal year. Um, we had a total in August of $250,036.82. Our expenses were pretty light at $761.13. Our income was even lighter at $1.03, <laughs> which is the overwhelming interest that we get on our savings account. <laughs> so why do we not have any income in September? It has to do with accounting and when they were able to actually come up with a number and turn it over to us. I have made a rather large deposit at the beginning of October, which will show in the October treasurer's report. So we're fine. We're not getting no money. It just isn't showing up. Our bank end of the year or end of the month's checking balance was $84,801.88, less $121.13 of uncashed checks. Our savings account, which is earning us so much interest, <laughs> is $164,595.97, which is the for a total of $249,276.72, which matches what we thought it was supposed to be. <laughs> Questions? Board report. This will be the shortest board report, perhaps on record. Uh, with the transition from the, the year and the officers, Bob Deemer was the president council representative to the board and attended the last meeting. As the assistant representative, I was not, not able to attend, so I was not there. Bob is not here because he's no longer a member of, of the board, uh, the executive board. So we have no report. <laughs> um, stay tuned for another month or so. I think we'll, we'll embellish that. But, but the salient parts of the board report, I think we'll be hearing as Betsy shares a little bit. Everybody. Good morning. Good morning. As I said, I wish we had no debt, but we do have some bonds. Um, I'll start out with uh, some occupancy. Uh, we have been increasing in our occupancy, which is wonderful to see. Our independent living is currently 83% occupied, and we are 93% sold. We have 13 move-ins by the end of this year, so uh, that's really exciting news. Assisted living is currently at 76% and they are 81% sold. And our health center is currently at 93% uh, with our rehab still being closed. Um, we kind of go back and forth a little bit between rehab opening. Uh, we've got, first we think we're getting some staff and then the staff doesn't show up. And so um, it's really depending on how our staffing results are uh, as to when we open that rehab unit. Um, the one thing that we do have to do is uh, reapply to be able, to, with the state of Michigan, to be able to um, take care of any of our own residents that um, may come down with COVID. Um, in, in our COVID unit that we currently have, we just have to reapply for that. So Kathy Harmon, we just got the update on that. Kathy Harmon is in the process of uh, reapplying for, uh, for that license to be able to take care of our own residents. 
Um, our resident numbers are uh, 361 on our campus. We have 205 in independent living plus 54 second persons. 65 in our assisted living and 37 in our health center and rehab. Uh, employee numbers, uh, we have seen a dip. Actually, uh, last month we had 237 FTEs and we currently have 221. Mm. Uh, so that has gone down and we are budgeted for 254. Wow. So one of the things that we're taking a really strong look at is um, our, our wages because we may hi hire somebody and then we find out they left because they are going to get a dollar or two more down the road. Um, and it's not necessarily just in our industry, but the, the people that were really struggling to fill the positions are our frontline staff who may go to Target or Taco Bell and you know they're not going to another healthcare um, uh, community to, uh, to get those higher dollars. So, um, you know, we're, we're doing some calculations. I'm working with LCS uh, to kind of see what that means um, uh, to our residents, but also really working with our directors to uh, fine tune our pencils and just see where we can really cut back possibly with our budget that we presented this year to offset some of those dollars that we may see in an increase. So I'll keep you all posted on that, but um, just wanted to let you know it is something that we are still looking at um, in mid-October, which is almost here, uh, we're supposed to be getting some protocol from OSHA, which is um, for the vaccine mandate. We know that it's going to be a struggle if we mandate vaccine. We know we are probably going to lose some staff. Um, and the staff that we are hiring, we're sharing that with them, that it may be very possible that we have to start mandating the vaccine um, but the protocol hasn't come out yet from OSHA whether or not it's gonna be allowed to uh, test out for anybody who uh, doesn't receive the vaccine that they would be able to bring, uh, do a, uh, a COVID test uh, and, and get a negative test for continuing to work here. So we're, we're really just waiting for that protocol to, to get into place. You know, I, I continue to receive messages from families um, about the full vaccinating um, and, and the staff being mandated to vaccinate. Um, I get some shame on yous. <laughs> I get, uh, you're not doing the best thing for our residents. So just know we need to make sure we have the staff here to be able to care for our residents and, and provide the services and things that we're currently providing. So um, I will definitely keep you all posted as we learn more about that. Let's see, some of our updates. Uh, the pool table has been installed in the clubhouse. Uh, we ask that you please do not move the table um, or the shuffleboard tables um, and that you do not sit on them or any of your guests <laughs> sit on them because if that happens, it will, it will actually um, uh, kind of take it off kilter and we're gonna have to have somebody come in here and reset the pool table, which you know just costs more dollars. So. We just ask uh, to make sure that your guests, if you're if you're in there with them, that they're not sitting on the pool table or or trying to move it in any way because it actually is in sections. When they set it up, it was kind of interesting to see how they uh, they set that up. We are working on uh, a little bit of a binder in terms of how to use some of the things in the clubhouse. There's uh, you know AV equipment and TVs and. Um, the grill, there's a grill with a little refrigerator. So we'll have a, um, in several different of these little booklets in the clubhouse so that if you need, needed to know how to use a piece of equipment, um, that information will be there for you. Really the main, we had a, a garden home resident meeting last, last I think it was last week, um, and really just shared with the residents that, you know, it's just, it's really no different than any other area here on our campus. If you were using our Kiva for a family event, we just ask that you clean up after yourselves as much as possible. Obviously, we'll have housekeeping to do some of the heavier things, but um, uh, we just uh, we just ask that you enjoy it and you use it and uh, and you just clean up after yourselves. We've got a little dirty and clean sign on the dishwasher, so if you use any of the dishes, 
put them in the dishwasher. Don't worry about starting it. Um, housekeeping will start it and empty it. Um, and that's really not uh, up to our residents to have to do. We will do that for you. It's just, if you'll put them in there for us, we'd appreciate it. Um, just some of the updates uh, on COVID and, and to Molly's point, these are community transmission, not Friendship Village, but the, the county of Kalamazoo, uh, these numbers. Um, and, and I compared it to last month when I made my, my report. So this particular report was October 8th for these numbers. Um, the number of cases in Kalamazoo went from 430 in September up to 650. Uh, positivity rate from 8.07% to 8.26%. Uh, the deaths are still less than 10%. Um, eligible population fully vaccinated went from 60.5% to 64.3%. So we are starting to see, you know, a, a slight increase in that. Um, and new hospital admissions went from 39 to 56. I know if any of you were watching the news this morning, um, they shared about the uh, numbers actually coming down in Michigan. However, locally, in Kalamazoo, the hospitals are really struggling trying to find beds for people that need them with COVID. Um, and they still have quite a few people in, in ICU. Um, and the majority of those people, if not all of them, from a conversation that we had on our ethics committee call, we have uh, BJ Priam, who uh, is a VP over at, uh, at Borges, or um, what's her new name? Uh, Ascension. Ocean. Ascension. Um, he said uh, primarily everybody that is in the hospital and specifically in ICU are unvaccinated individuals. So we encourage to, uh, you know, get our, our, um, our staff vaccinated as much as possible and continue to share with them the data and the facts uh, in a very gentle way as to not have them feel like they're being bullied or coerced into having the, the vaccine. Um, the flu clinic is planned for October 12th uh, in the Kiva, so that is tomorrow. So um, hopefully you all got the information. Um, sorry. Oh, I don't need to interrupt. No, you're fine. Pastor Brown. Oh, you're okay. Um, I just heard this morning uh, from the ambulance driver that both hospitals are on diversion, meaning that they will turn people away if possible. Uh, if you really insist on staying there, you will sit in the hall for up to five hours, perhaps. Yeah, they it's said that there are really just no beds available for, yeah. for people yeah, with really COVID. Cool. Yeah. Hmm. So we're hoping our staff, you know, starts changing their mind. Um, we did start um, uh, at our front desk for those contractors, vendors, anybody who is in here on a routine basis, which means at least weekly, we're asking for their vaccination card and or a copy of a test within the past seven days. So we are screening them a little bit more so than in the past, um, just to try to you know keep the amount of people down that, uh, um, that we don't know of that vaccination status or, or they haven't had a negative test. Um, as I was saying, the flu clinic is tomorrow. Hopefully you all got your information uh, on that. Um, if you know of anybody, uh, before I, I move on from COVID, um, we do have somebody coming in to give a Pfizer booster. So if you know of any residents who received Pfizer, and I think it's mostly new residents that have moved in because I think pretty much the majority, 99.9% .9 of our residents got the Moderna shot here with us. Um, you may have also heard in the news that the FDA was actually, or Moderna has gone to the FDA about the booster shot. We've not received the result back on that yet, but hopefully within the week, we'll find out whether or not that booster's been approved by FDA and um, we can get those clinics scheduled here for you as well. So um, stay tuned for a little bit more information on that. Um, and then lastly, uh, you may see some folks wandering around here with me tomorrow. Um, we are starting our master plan back up. Um, I looked at my notes and my agreement actually was last, was January of 2020 that we started this process with them. 
and unfortunately COVID uh, you know, took a toll on us and, and we didn't really do anything on that for a couple of years. So, um, so we will uh, start that process back up. Uh, we're meeting tomorrow on kind of uh, beginning concepts and visions as to what that might look like. There's nothing set in stone at any point at this time. It's just having those discussions in terms of, you know, what is it that uh, we're looking at from our community, greater Kalamazoo community, um, you know, what's, what's necessary, what's not. We know that the health center is, that's one going to be one uh, focus that um, uh, we've talked about in our uh, at different meetings that Ken has talked about the capital campaign for that. So. Um, we definitely know that that is needed, but in, in terms of where that might be, it, this is just the beginning discussions of, of all of that. So as, as things progress, I will keep you all updated as I do with all of the other projects that we have going on here in the village um, or on our campus anywhere, um, and I'll keep you all updated on that master plan. Uh, but I will be taking people through touring tomorrow just so that they can see if they haven't been to Friendship Village, you know, what our, our building currently looks like um, and what we currently offer. So, any other questions for me? Is there any thought, Betsy, in increasing our pay to make us more competitive? There is, and that's one of the things that I've been working on with Life Care Services, is we've taken all of our employees um, and we looked at who's not currently at $15 an hour, and that kind of seems to be that point where people would choose to come here uh, versus maybe going to Target or some of the other places that are offering around that same amount. Um, who's not currently at 15? Who's at 15 and might have to get bumped up a little bit so that they don't feel that um, new people coming in are getting paid more than them? Um, uh, and then in the next budget year, we may have to look at rippling uh, any of those other folks that are close to that $16 an hour that we may have to escalate up a little bit. We're not going to do that for this first time because I think the, the, main, the main focus right now and the positions that we're really having a hard time filling are people that are currently under $15 an hour. So um, what that would mean to the residents is kind of what I'm working with Life Care Services on and how many employees that actually um, uh, includes. Um, and then on top of that, I've, I've asked the directors to go back and kind of sharpen their pencils and, and look to see what additional savings that we could see this year in our budget. Um, and and I'm, I'm really happy with what I've seen come back from our directors on that. I think it's definitely going to help to supplement that increase, but um, but yes, that is definitely top priority right now because we just see our numbers continue to decrease and it's, uh, it, it's really difficult, especially trying to make sure that we're cleaning your apartments the way that your apartments are supposed to be cleaned and, um, you know, we're serving you and not having to close the cafe and um, just really needing to get our numbers up and hopefully by increasing that pay that will uh, attract more folks to come to Friendship Village and work versus, uh, you know, maybe a, a Target or a Taco Bell, or I'm sorry, I keep using them, but those are, <laughs> those are the two names that keep coming up, you know, as well, you know, Target's doing this, or McDonald's is doing this, and, um, and Taco Bell was, you know, giving their cooks $18 an hour. And, you know, we, we have wage matrix, a, a wage matrix in place, and just because we say, you know, if, if you're a cook and you have experience, you're not gonna start out at a starting wage of $15. You're gonna be, um, let's say somebody has five years experience as a cook somewhere, they'll be placed when they come in at that five year uh, range. So it's not that all new employees would be coming in at $15 an hour, it's really, just new employees that are coming in more um, that don't have any experience are, are more likely to come in closer to that $15 an hour than somebody with experience would. So um, I, I think that the ripple effect will also help next year as we budget looking at um, you know, how close are those other 
positions that are here to that starting rate um, and just kind of rippling that a little bit in what we call a, a, a wage matrix adjustment, if you will, and, and we can do those based on uh, how many years of service folks have, or staff has, but yes, look, taking a good hard look at it and, and possibly, you know, one of the things that I need to do is give our residents a 60 day notice uh, as part of the Michigan or I'm sorry, the Office of Federal Insurance Regulation. However, because of the amount of staff that we have currently are down, I think that we could make those increases sooner rather than have to wait for the 60 days because we're already uh, saving money in the budget and, and that would definitely help to start that sooner rather than later. So um, why the increase may not come to you for 60 days, it may be something that we start earlier with the staff. Um, but I have my bosses coming in tomorrow. Um, we're going to sit and talk a little bit more about that along with the um, finance analysis that's doing this analysis for me at, at LCS. Uh, we just need to get on that, get on the phone and, and make that decision, present it to the board, and we can do that in a, a quick toll. Uh, they all know we're doing this, and so we don't have to have a special board meeting where everybody gets together. Uh, to have to do that. We, we do some things on electronic vote as well, so uh, that can move things along faster also. Will the road around the building be paved yet this fall? So the road around the building, will it be paved this fall? And we are, we, we have really been struggling trying to find somebody that can fit us in. Um, it's most likely that it won't. Um, Unfortunately, I tried to get, I, I got ABB involved and said, hey, do you have any pull? <laughs> you know, they, they, they did our, you know, the whole garden home neighborhood. I said, is there anybody you can call, any pull that you have? And, and John came back to me and just said, I, I got nothing. I, I've checked around in all these different places and everybody is just booked because they're also short staff, you know? So uh, it's, it's most likely that it'll be paved in the spring. And maybe that's a good time to do it because then it doesn't get tore up this winter. <laughs> so, any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Betsy. Um, other business, um, Kim. Kim Cummings has an announcement for us. I'm reporting from the Green Group, which is uh, one wing of the Environmental and Sustainability Committee of Resident Council. The, uh, the Green Group has, it's probably just as well that we've concluded that we can't save the planet by ourselves. Uh, <laughs> we, we, can't even, we can't even collect all the styrofoam that's produced in the world. Uh, but we can do our part as we ought to, and in conjunction with a brand new city initiative, uh, we are planning a uh, collection, our first uh, Friendship Village collection of uh, styrofoam for Saturday, October 23rd. Uh, people, the flyers, which are still being finalized, will be arriving uh, sort of both in the uh, apartments of, of independent living and in the boxes, the in-house boxes for the garden homes. Uh, we're asking the residents to put out uh, all the items that are allowed all the styrofoam items that are allowed, and it's somewhat complicated to distinguish between those that are allowed and those that aren't, uh, before 7.30 uh, on that Saturday of the 23rd. And uh, again, details are still being worked out, but we're asking that the garden home residents put out any of their items uh, sort of outside the kitchen exit, uh, sort of of the clubhouse. But again, details are just being, uh, are just being finalized. Uh, so th that's our tentative plan. Uh, it's uh, it's more complicated than it than it might appear because 
certain items, certain styrofoam items are permitted and others are not. And uh, that distinction is really new to most of us, most residents, and so that we need to pay attention to what works uh, uh, for the recycling and what does not. I don't know if there are any questions uh, that uh, are appropriate at this point that people might have. Uh, I'm hoping that the flyer can answer most of the concerns that you might have. 7.30 a.m.? 7.30 p.m. So, so the question, who's in charge of the villager? <laughs> well, I, I, I suppose that's a little bit of me, a little bit of Betsy, and um, you know, what we are hoping is that for those who want a printed copy, they can have a printed copy. You know, that they're, they're not, not available. Um, so they're, they're available at the Life Enrichment Office, they're available at the front desk, and true, they're not packed out to everybody's box. But it's 10 pages times 300 at color. I mean, it's, it's, it is an expense um, that we were hopeful that folks would be able to, you know, do with the, with the online version because so many of you are now pretty adept at managing care merge and managing to, to your inboxes to, to read these things. If you want a printed copy, we're happy to give you a printed copy. You know, if, if, if there's 100 people who want a printed copy, we'll make 100 copies. You know, in a sense, we're trying to avoid printing 300 copies. Um, but if it's, you know, if it's something that everyone, you know, if there's consensus on and people want us to continue to do it, we, we can do it. It's, it's not a labor issue. It was, it's really a, a paper and ink um, issue. So if, if it's, you know, we, you know we're, we're taking feedback on it, and, and yeah, we've heard a few grumblings, but honestly, I haven't heard that many grumblings. You know, so maybe they're just not getting, getting to me, which is fine, which is fine. I don't always hear all the grumblings, um, but we're happy to do it. You know, we can certainly provide copies. Yeah, um, I'd like to say thank you for providing the copies of things because I find sometimes uh, the PDF downloads take a long time and you're constantly having to delete all those things if you're functioning off campus with a phone. And I appreciate doing that. I also question that we have very high sophisticated copy equipment here. It's extremely expensive for individuals to buy the necessary printed to print things off and like that. And since we have purchased those items to be used, I really appreciate having those because I don't like spending so much time on my devices constantly deleting things and taking out PDFs and everything. I think, um, you know, being able to do that, and I guess I'm disappointed, you know, that uh, the point about the uh, news thing that 
unites us all. I keep a book of new people so that I can do that. And I think you're asking a lot of people to, uh, you know, expect them to have a printer that they use and keep it maintained. And uh, I question it from an environmental standpoint because I know mass copiers are much cheaper to maintain. Well, so that's my, that's my feeling, and I thank you for making it available. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point, point. And, and our intent isn't to transfer the printing costs. You know, I guess we're hoping that people read it on their screen. I don't want people, you know, but if they're not reading it on the screen and they're printing it, then that's worse than us printing it in a lot of ways. Yeah. Is it possible when the new monthly villager is available that there could be notices posted on the bulletin boards on the different floors and in different spots around the building just reminding people that the October so that they would, if they hadn't saw it on Care Merge, that they would at least know to go to the desk and ask for a copy? Yeah, we, we can do that. I mean, generally, well, I guess, you know, Assumptions are dangerous things. I mean, the villager comes out on the first of the month. Um, and pretty reliable, well, I don't know that it's ever missed the deadline. <laughs> but, you know, we can certainly do that. Or we can return to printing things, too. So, um, it, yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting. Would it be possible to have who want to receive hard copies simply let the life enrichment office know that. They keep a list of who those are and when things come out that they put them in the boxes. Well, we, we could do that. Um, I, I don't see why we couldn't do that. Do what she said. Oh, so the question was is could we keep a list of people who want printed copies and then distribute just to those people who printed copies? I look at the report on the funds, and I see <clears throat> a large amount for the library, which I think is wonderful, a garden fund, knitters fund, woods fund, woodshop fund. What about a publication fund that would cover the villager and other publications that many residents would really appreciate have, having in a printed form? Not everybody has a computer, and yes, they could go to the desk and get a printed copy, but do they really have to do that? Is it really that much of a cost? When I look at $249,000, uh, couldn't we come up with a fund that would cover some publications? It's a question for the board and well, the administrators. This, this has been really enlightening. I, I do appreciate people bringing, bringing this up. Honestly, I, I had no, I mean, I knew that there were a handful of people who were objecting to the electronic versions, but I didn't really realize that it was maybe this pervasive. So we'll, we'll reassess that whole, that whole policy. I just feel that the villager gives such a good impression. It does. And we can share it with our friends <coughs> We can go back and look at it and review what we thought we wanted to remember but didn't. And I just think it connects us all. So I think we should continue it. Could we have, at this point, just a straw vote from the people here who would very much like to continue to have the villager in printed fashion. Could you just raise your hand so that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That, that was pretty loud. <laughs> that was a silent thing, but boy. Yeah, I, that, I turned that reverberated. My, <laughs> I turned my mic off just so it was. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. <laughs> we'll save money someplace else. Okay. <laughs> Is there any other business? Oh. Just from a sustainability portion uh, or, or matter having to do with the villager, could we use cheaper paper, more, more recycled paper, um, 
some some way to cut down on, on our use of trees. Well, you know that that's that's an interesting point. We could look into that. I mean, I don't I don't know the answer to that. Uh, you know, we we tend to choose I think paper already that has a recycled co you know component to it. Hundred percent recycled paper really isn't very good. In fact, a lot of uh, machines like ours will get crumbled up on them. Um, but we can maybe look at, see if we're using the highest recycled content paper that we could possibly get for just the villager. Um, I don't know, you know, it's a good point, Barbara. We'll, we'll take a look at it. Could we have some kind of an idea of what we're talking about in terms of money? How much does it cost to print the villager? That might make a difference for all of us. 16 cents a page. A page? It's eight cents a copy per page, and it's two-sided. So a colored piece of paper is eight cents a side. So 16 cents per sheet, and you've got 10 sheets times 300. So that's, is, what's my math on? Is that 3,000 sheets? $480. $480, you know, which is $500 times 12. I mean, it, you know, it, it adds up when you look at it over. Yeah, but it's, it's, 5, yeah. it's what? 5750 per year. $5,700 annually for the villager printing. So, I mean, is that a lot of money? Yeah, that's a lot of money. Is that like an inordinate amount of money that we can't, you know, maintain in the budget? I mean, we've been doing it for years and years and years. Um, but that was, that was, you know, that was the rationale behind it and recognizing that the electronic versions were being used. But, you know, I also heard a pretty loud thunder this morning, so, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll look at this and maybe if we change the cost of the paper, and that's just the cost of the machine, that's 16 cents, that's not factoring in the cost of the paper itself, right? So we'll have to figure, I mean, that would just add to it. Not sure about anyone else, but I went on the waiting list about four years ago, and they started mailing the villager to my home in Coldwater. Right. I have a three ring binder upstairs with every single one of them for the last four years, and I, on a regular basis, pull that out and look things up because it's I really enjoy receiving it. So the 1st of October, I rushed downstairs to make sure I got a copy. So just a quick point, I know of another um, place like Friendship Village in Grand Rapids and it's all paid for by residents. So they collect money in order to have their... Uh, right, well that, that would be to Mary's point of creating a donor fund on, on, on that. And boy, I, I hate to yeah. divert donor, donor dollars to that, but we'll see. Yes, sir. Well, you do have copies in the media center going way back every month, right? Yeah, so there are archived copies of the villager uh, in the media center. There are archived copies on CareMerge that go back um, at least two or three years. And the archives committee is actually beginning to digitize the original villagers. So very soon, and I don't know that it's there yet. Is it there yet? I think um, we're, just, we're just waiting for access on the computer to get to the... Right, so very soon, we're gonna, you'll be able to find, on CareMerge anyway, issue one, volume one, number one. And I think we have digitized, I think the first year or two years, um, care, uh, Tom's got his hand up, he's actually done the work. Four years. Four years. We've got the first four years digitized, so that'll end up on cameras. You know, so we're not gonna print those copies anymore, but you know, to, to, to Dick's point of, of there being archive stuff, it's, you know, that is out there. And, and there are printed copies in the resource center. So, so to Barbara's point, 
the residents already are paying for all right. of them. <laughs> right, because that's the only place that, that we get any of our, our, all of our funds from. So, you know, when, when I asked the staff to kind of go through and, and look at, you know, what are some of the different things that we can be doing, um, you know, it's everything that, that you all get together, you all pay for. Anything that, um, like home health, if you needed home health, that's separate so that all the residents don't pay for that. The resident who's receiving those, you know, pay those services pay for that. So everything that affects the, the whole organization is paid by all of the residents and, and we can certainly continue to do that. We just, as I always say every budget year, we try to be fiduciary, you know, it's our fiduciary responsibility to try to make sure that we're, you know, keeping that that uh, percentage of increase down as much as we possibly can. And so we're always looking at, at new opportunity. What's difficult is when you're walking down the hall and you look in the trash by the mailboxes and there's some villagers in there, you know? <laughs> and that, that's where we come up with those ideas to say, wow, maybe people wouldn't mind getting this in electronic version um, because we do see them, you know, thrown away. So. Um, but you know, if the vast majority of people you know would like to have that in a in a hard copy, we can certainly continue to do that. It is something that you all pay for already in your monthly service fees. So um, make you feel better. I've seen people pick them up and take them. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, there there are people that go in the trash bag baskets and, and take them out and take them with them. So they're probably taking them for friends or somebody else who they might want to give them to. But Please know that they're available at the front desk. You don't have to go through the trash cans looking for them. We do have them for you. <laughs> no dumpster diving. No dumpster diving, right. Ken? Where, I'm sorry, oh right there, I'm sorry. If you took the hard copies away from us, Diane mentioned you send them out to the people that are on the waiting list. Did you also take them away from them? We've never sent them hard copies. Well. Actually, it's been a long well, time Mark, since we've sent hard copies. Yeah, Mark, Mark and might squirrel away 10 copies to send out to prospects, but generally speaking, generally, nowadays, uh, it's all um, prospects or people who have made deposits are given a care merge account. And so they're, they're seeing the same thing you're seeing with all of the information that, that's put out there. And they find it really valuable. I mean, they're not getting a printed copy um, but they are getting the electronic versions, and you know, and that yeah. seems to be working fairly well for that for that group of people who are coming in. There, there may be a few people that are yeah. out there that don't have computers that our our sales department is still sending those to um, right. in a hard copy. But the majority of all that is sent electronically. Yeah. Okay, if we're on to a different topic, I have a question back here. There's been recent discussion about the Greatest Needs Fund, and I know that some of the funds are reported by resident council on the treasurer's report. Some of them are reported by Friendship Village, but I have not seen anywhere a bank balance on the Greatest Needs Fund. Is there a way for residents to know what that bank balance is and where it's reported? So yes, there is, and the uh, the PAC committee gets that information on a monthly basis, so the residents get it through there. Um, moving forward, I haven't even had a chance to talk to Suzanne about this, as, as she's looking to do a different type of uh, treasurer's report for monthly meetings at resident council. I can give a monthly report on the greatest needs fund and the other funds. For those of you who are unaware, there's. So there's like two big buckets of philanthropy here in the village. Um, one is overseen by the resident council, and one is overseen um, by, by administration. And the resident council funds you see pretty regularly. That's the employee appreciation fund, the woods fund, the garden fund, it's all the stuff that's on your list. The administration philanthropy is not quite as many funds. There's, there's the friends fund, there's the greatest needs fund. There's the life and wellness, um, uh, life enrichment and wellness fund, and then a few miscellaneous things. Montessori has a fund, um, and we're creating uh, the health center capital campaign fund. 
So that's another bucket of philanthropy that's going on. And, you know, so to answer your question, uh, the greatest needs fund right now, I don't want to misspeak. Um, well, let, let me put it this way. I'll have a report next month. It, it, it will pleasantly surprise you all, honestly. It will pleasantly surprise you all. We just got a, a pretty significant estate gift to the Greatest Needs Fund, and we just got a pretty significant estate gift to the Wellness and Life Enrichment Fund, and the Friends Fund is knocking on $12 million, actually a little more than $12 million. So overall, donor uh, philanthropy at the Village is really pretty strong. We're coming off probably our best year in a very, very, very long time this, this past year. So, and, and honestly, I've probably been remiss because I usually give an annual report and COVID really kind of messed up with, with the schedule. And it's on my list to do an annual report. And now that we just closed off fiscal 21, I was looking to do an annual report on all the funds, all of the funds. campus quite a bit of your time and I do appreciate reading uh, you know the information about people keep wearing your masks and I would like people to I would like to thank people here for doing that the people that do I would also like to give you a couple of things that we were observers of where we were and uh, one of our people that lives in our community has had kidney transplant. Another person is undergoing chemotherapy. And when you wear your mask, you are protecting those people. And we are our brother's keepers. I see people around here who are not wearing masks when they're playing cards and other activities. And I'm concerned about that. And I have said to people, you know, I'm wearing my mask to protect you. How about if you wear your mask to protect me? And I think we need to keep this up. Uh, we had a situation where I went to the post office and it's a very remote area where we we're at. And there were people six feet apart, they were wearing their masks. People that had been vaccinated, they had a breakthrough incident. They were sent over to Cadillac to get infusion. And these were all vaccinated people, so I think uh, we need to protect people that can't protect themselves because they, they've had chemotherapy or something like that. And I think we don't think about that. And when people say something to me, when I say something, I think it's not just about you. It's about everybody that's here and what their history is. And you have no idea about things that people, is their personal health business. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Any other business? We stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. See you next month.